asked to talk a little bit about developmental milestones. And so we're going to go over that. Uh, in, in the end, we're going to talk about red flags and other resources that you can have for your baby. Um, so just to do an introduction, as a general pediatrician or as a nurse practitioner, we um, are recommended to do developmental and behavioral surveillance during all routine uh, well visits and uh, throughout childhood. Uh, well visits are also called, you know, physicals or so forth, like preventive care visits. So in general, those routine ones that you're told to always come back to. <laughs> um, developmental disabilities, uh, also sometimes called de developmental disorders, are a group of conditions caused by impairments in learning, language, motor skills, and uh, behavior. Uh, so for example, for the first year, uh, during the pediatric visits, so the ones that I would see you at, we do newborn visits and then one, two, four, six, nine, and 12 month visits. So those are set and recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics. You might have more visits, but those are the minimum um, visits that are recommended. And this is me again. So, <laughs> I'm like, it's me all the time. Um, so the developmental screenings um, are instead, so not surveillance. So developmental screenings are standardized tests to identify asymptomatic children who are at risk for developmental delays. So these screening tests are recommended to do be done uh, at nine months, eighteen months, and twenty four months. Um, and we also have specific screenings for autism that are done at 18 months and 24 months. Um, there are different types of tests, so it doesn't have to be, we don't all, like different practices might use a certain standardized test, but it should be a, a standardized test. If that makes sense. Okay, so what is the difference between what Dr. Godoy does and what we do and what is the difference between her screenings and kind of my screenings. So the checklists done at the well baby visits um, are checklists and guides. They're not really meant to diagnose anything and they're not really meant to, as a means of um, medicalizing. So it's a screen to just flag when things are maybe going just left of where we were expecting. Um, and it's a really great way to escalate care. So um, the same way, um, Dr. Godoy's visit has a purpose and that purpose is to screen or maybe to treat and implement. My uh, visits are are very different where like you would not come to me for a cold or vaccines or any type of other care because that that's this world. <laughs> All I do is the very detailed developmental evaluation. It's different than a screening. So if Dr. Godoy does have a kid that flags on a screen or flags on um, her surveillance, she will escalate and then um, uh, uh, bring that child to my attention. And I do standardized developmental evaluations, whereas her checklists might be six to eight questions. Mine are like 420 questions and they take an hour and a half. Um, it's a very different um, feel and it's a very different type of evaluation. Um, I'll tell you, I also see some preterm kids at birth um, for six, 12, 18, and 24 months. So we do have a similar timeline. I'm just seeing um, a subset of children who need more time to really go through the types of milestones that we're gonna be seeing. Um, I will tell you a little bit of um, an adjustment that was made a few years ago. And I think it's causing not a little bit of confusion, but a little bit of um, a disruption of where people feel that milestones should fall. So if you um, go to a pediatrician that has been trained more than five years ago, which is absolutely totally fine and normal, or if you've had a kid that's seven years old, or if you remember your aunt saying something about a milestone, and you're like, hey, I thought you said we were supposed to be crawling by seven months. Why don't you care about it until 10 now? That's happening a lot. And I'll explain why that's happening. In 2019, the CDC, not thinking about COVID that wasn't happening yet, wanted to update all of our milestones. So they brought together 11 specialists in each of the areas of development and made sure that we were all talking about what it meant to meet a milestone and what it meant to achieve it or what it meant to miss it. So we standardized our milestones. And that did mean that some that we said were at six or seven really got moved to 10 or 11. It doesn't mean that we were expecting kids to be acting differently. 
what it meant is that we changed what the definition was. So before some doctors were saying, if 50% of the kids make that milestone, that's where we're gonna place the milestone. In reality, that didn't give a chance for the majority of the kids or the entire population to be um, accurately represented. So we changed the definition and standardized it to be 75% of kids meeting this milestone is where that milestone should be placed on the timeline, if this makes sense. So before crawling, we cared about seven or eight months. It's really closer to nine or 10 months because that's when 75% or the majority of kids are making that milestone. The reason we did that was because if a child misses a milestone now, we don't say, let's just wait and see for the next visit. If you miss a milestone, that's your red flag. You learn the signs and you act early. You say, if that's a missed milestone, then that's a missed milestone. We're going to go find Monica or whoever your Monica equivalent is in your life. <laughs> My Monica. <laughs> and we're going to escalate uh, to someone who can really do one of those standardized evaluations. Um. So that's a big thing that I think when people are coming to my office, they're like, well, I had a seven-year-old and we didn't care about pointing mm -hmm. until, you know, that's a big one. Or do you point at 12 months? Do you point at 15 months? Do you point at two years? The answer is at some point, all of those were the right answer. And now it's like, we really care about pointing closer to 15 months, even though I know 12 month olds that point like, no problem. But if you're looking at someone who's been trained five or you know, 10 years ago, they might say up to two years. And I'm like, oh, no, I hope that you are in my office before that so that we can really get this going. Um, other things that I wanted um, to talk about, because later we're going to talk about what qualifies you for services. Some milestones live in multiple domains, meaning when I see that your baby's smiling, not only is that a beautiful language milestone, because we're showing, we're expressing ourselves, so that is a gesture language, but it's also a social emotional language, right? I'm smiling because I like you, not just because I have gas. Like, I'm excited for us to be here now together. Um, also, putting our hands in our mouth is a huge motor milestone, but it's also a cognitive milestone because kids can only explore with their mouths before their hands are dexterous enough to manipulate objects. So these things are uh, important because when we're talking about um, delays, I want to make sure we're talking about delays in more than one area, or if that smile is still just gas, I want to make sure we're looking at things in the big picture. Um, and then the third little tidbit that I usually have to say to parents because they get nervous is that kids can only develop on one side of their brain at a time, meaning kids really can only excel or work on one motor milestone at a time. If you've ever heard, oh, my kids stopped talking when we started potty training, that's actually normal. My kids stopped acquiring words when we started crawling, that's actually normal. My kids got really clumsy after a growth spurt, that's really normal. So those things that like terrify you, like, oh my gosh, is that regression, the big scary, I have milestone regression, and then we think of the big scary A, and then everyone runs to me, a lot of those things are, they're normal things that we can expect. Um, but I want to see if we really lost a skill or if we've just been put on the back burner while we're working on other things. So the way to figure those things out or to spend an extended amount of time with the child as they're going through a play routine, and that's just not a reasonable amount of time to be had at a primary care visit. So that's where we both fit into this realm. I need Dr. Godoy to see every single child in the universe and, and screen them so that she can cherry pick the ones that might be red flagging so that I can then spend very long amounts of time with just those children to make sure that they're okay. So that's how both of us kind of fit together. I can't screen every human because we'd be there all day. All of my exams are about 90 minutes, sometimes longer. And Dr. Godoy can't spend 90 minutes with all of her children because, I mean, then the practice would close because <laughs> we'd have no time for any boogers. <laughs> Nothing else. Really Nothing about. else. <laughs> so okay. newborn baby, one month milestones. The way we're going to do this is we're going to kind of ping pong back and forth from each other. I'm going to talk about what milestones we should expect. And Dr. Godoy is going to talk about things that you can do to help foster those things. I think for the newborn um, milestone, we sort of, it's not much. It's more about knowing that we actually screen for the babies before they go home from the hospital. We do a hearing screen then, because how are you developing language and speech and everything? In, if you cannot hear well. So that's part of the screening from the beginning. We are also doing um, the state newborn screen that 
is recommended for all and actually required for all new babies. And that is a screen that entails a lot of metabolic and genetic disorders that have a higher risk of having developmental delays um, and so forth. It doesn't mean that you will have, but it means that it's a high risk and those should be you know, screened further. Um, otherwise, as a newborn baby or a mon one month old baby, it's not much to do in a milestone apart that they should be flexed and that's normal it's normal that baby to have a tone if they're a floppy sloppy baby that is just flat stretched arms that's actually low tone and that's not good for a newborn baby so I think that's what's important to know that they are fisted and they are flexed and it's hard to stretch them out when we're trying to do their uh, their length um, and that's a good set, uh, sign and I think that's good sometimes for parents to know mm -hmm. um so some things to do at home before you visit with us. So if you don't have a NICU follow-up appointment with me um, and you're waiting for your first visit with Dr. Godoy, um, some things that you should do for your babes. I'm definitely smiling and acting excited. Um, that sounds ridiculous, but you're modeling a behavior. Their first uh, motor and language behavior is going to be a social smile at you. Um, so you should show them what that is. So even if you're exhausted and nobody helped you clean the dishes last night and your two-year-old has a fever, and you don't know the return policy on babies, uh, smiling to your baby is perfection. Also reading to your baby every night. Let's talk about this. Even if your baby is not paying attention to this book, it is a wonderful practice to establish from birth. A, it helps us establish a night routine. It helps them cue themselves for sleep. You will get a better sleepy baby if you cue them with a nice soft book read at night. Um, also, reading to them establishes language. Uh, it has been shown that listening to your mother or father or caregiver's voice actually changes the white matter and cortical matter in your baby's brain and it makes them smarter. It will um, activate the uh, the Broca complex and it actually it activates language earlier in these children. So even if you don't talk to your baby throughout the day, like the, the way I did like a psycho, um, if you read to them at night, then hearing your cadence changes their brain and makes them better talkers later. That's why chatty parents have chatty babies. It makes sense. That's why my kid won't shut up. <laughs> um, snuggling your baby. There's no such thing as a spoiled baby. Snuggling, holding, um, and cuddling a baby actually helps them feel safe. It, it um, helps them soothe themselves better. And it, it seems counterintuitive. Um, but in the beginning, creating that safe and uh, bond actually helps them realize that you are the safety. So having you around is safe. And that bond helps. Um, unplugging. This is a big problem. It's happened more and more. I am guilty of it. But I see so many parents that are feeding their babies and not making eye contact because they're also scrolling on Instagram while their baby's being fed. While that is a wonderful mastery of uh, multitasking, I, we need you to unplug. I need eye contact back on babies. It has been proven to um, improve the bond between mom and babies. It actually improves the feeding between mom and babies because when you make parents and babies, when you make that eye contact while you're feeding, um, it helps the baby really pace themselves and stay engaged and organized in their own feeding session, which seems insane, but put your phone down and your kid will feed better, I promise you. And then caring, take care of yourself. Do you remember that time that you just made a human or just made a home to bring home your child or just worked really, really hard to like get that adoption done or get that fostering done? And that was so hard, getting the baby home is exhausting. You need to recover from that. Um, some of you have had abdominal surgery. We forget that like C-sections are full abdominal surgeries. Like, please take care of yourself. Parenting is ridiculous. Nobody warns you about it or else there would be a population of zero. Please take time. Ask neighbors, friends, family for help. I love babysitting. I'm just kidding. Don't ask me for help. <laughs> I'm exhausted. <laughs> We're all close. Um, by the way, the pictures are actually approved by parents. <laughs> <laughs> so for each of the domains, I made this little chart for you guys. So it's really easy. One stop shopping. Two months. Cognitive. Your babies will start watching you as you move. They'll look at toys for several seconds, or we call it habituating. So if you put a, a toy in front of them, they'll look at it. If you put a new toy in front of it, they'll look at that one. And they're like, oh my gosh, look at the world. Also, that part where you're supposed to talk to your baby, they will start to look at your face around two months. It's amazing. 
I feel like that's like the best first milestone when they're like, oh, hey, parent. Uh, language, variable cry. You're going to know what this means. Any parent with a kid that is over three, in the beginning, all the cries are boah, boah, boah. And then they figure out an I'm hungry scream. They figure out that you changed me too late cry, that I'm exhausted and I will start being an active terrorist. Like they are different cries and you will know them all. Um, reacts to loud sounds. So in the beginning, everyone's like, oh, my baby's so great that we can bring them to restaurants and they don't care. There's going to be a time around two months where that stops, where they're going to switch their face around loud noises. They're going to start to pull up and protect themselves when they think that there's something too loud going on. This is a big one that I get asked a lot. Nasal or throaty sounds. I always hear that parents are like, oh, my kid's congested. Or why does my kid sound like a baby goat? Normal. It's completely normal. Um, and your baby's probably not sick. You can always call and ask. Um, but that like little like snorty sound at night that they make, that's normal. The throaty, <laughs> normal. We put it out here because I feel like everyone, that's everyone's question. Yes, yes, what, my kid congested. No, it's not your, their nose holes are too small. Motor. <laughs> that's, what I, that's what it is. <laughs> um, we're starting to hold our head up during tummy time. Not beautifully, not 45 degrees or 90 degrees, but just starting to lift our head off that mat just a little bit is a beautiful milestone. And that's also why we promote tummy time from the very beginning because those neck muscles are really important for sitting stability and then feeding stability later. So absolutely get your tummy time on. Um, moving both arms and legs. So in the beginning, when babies move, they kind of just spastically kick out both their arms and legs, uh, a little Mara reflex or a little kicking reflex. Around two months, we'll start to see a reciprocal kick. So one leg and then the other, or one arm and then the other, wonderful. When babies are born, like Dr. Godoy said, they have their little fighting fists up the whole time around two months. We should be open about, about half the time. If we're not, then that's the time I would start sticking things in their hands to just remind them that they have hands. Um, social emotional. This is the best. At two months, they start to calm when you pick them up because they like you. They are happy. You can see that they're happy when you greet them. I had this wonderful exam today with um, a uh, one month, like 27 day old and kid was fine with me looking at me in the eyes, doing great. And then mom came behind me and this child was like, you are dead to me. Look at this woman. <laughs> and the happiness that this two month old was showing was just the sweetest thing. Um, but absolutely. And then it followed immediately by a beautiful social smile. Um, and those smiles are wonderful. They're not because we're bearing down or we've had a full belly. They're really, when they see you, they are like genuinely happy to see you. That's when you forget that you didn't sleep last night. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So basically what, what do we do or what do we recommend for to do at home? At home? So at the two months, like she already said, the tummy time is the biggest thing that we are pushing and promoting. Um, around two months of age, we want 30 to, well, 15 to 30 minutes daily. That's not in one session. Most babies are not going to do that in one session. So you might have to do it in, in increment. Sometimes it's hard to figure out when to do it because if they're too hungry, they're too upset. If they just ate, then they're going to spit up and it's, Sometimes it's a little bit hard to figure it out, but some, they do it better and better and also promotes a beautiful round head and we don't get this flat headedness in, in the back. Um, and like Monica also said before, from the beginning, try to set a routine, even if it's not, you don't want to, they're not robots and, and this is not something that is going to be strict. Sometimes a baby want to feed every hour. Sometimes, you know, they can pace it and they could be every three hours and so forth, but and you have to follow their cues, but you could try to see, you know, wake windows and when it's not good to take a nap and so forth. So you're not stretching it too long and then it's overtiredness and it gets uh, even worse. So I think that's also a good time to to start doing. They're starting to sleep more at night and not the whole day because in the beginning, it's often reversed when the babies come home from the hospital. Mm -hmm. We always blame the mother because they sleep when the mom is up during the day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, here we That's have four months. <laughs> uh, four months. Four months now. Four months. So um, there's this great thing that happens um, at around four months. You're going to get a sleep regression around four months. And before that, our feeding is more reflexive, meaning you stroke the side of the cheek or you smell like milk and the baby turns to the milk source and eats. After our sleep regression, feeding switches from reflexive to cognitive. So sometimes that's when parents are like, oh my gosh, my baby started drooling so much more. Oh my gosh, 
Um, I feel like the baby's starting to play with the nipple or spit the nipple out or be weird. And like the feeding pattern's different. That's because they're now making a choice to feed. And it's wonderful because the other part of this is that they are now opening their mouth when they show, see food, not just their food, but your food. They'll see the bottle and all of a sudden you'll see the, mm, 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 which is, adorable. Um, but that's also a really strong form of skill. And it's a really reassuring milestone because it shows me that our brain has developed away from the reflexive and toward the cognitive. Um, the other thing that happens at four months is they find their hands. So before this, if you ever wanted to play with your baby and stick a toy in their hand, they'll hold the toy and still look at you. Around four months, they'll hold the toy and then they're like, oh my God. The duck is in my hands. Oh my gosh, I have hands. And it's the best thing because they can stare at these things all day long and they can never drop them. So it's like automatic play toy for hours of entertainment. Um, the other thing that happens here is carrying objects to the mouth. This seems counterintuitive during our, our COVID culture. Everyone's like, oh, take that out of your mouth. Oh, take that out of your mouth. It's actually really important for babies to stick not dangerous, but stick toys in their mouth because that's how they explore and that's how they learn. And it's actually, it is a milestone. I look for kids to go hand to mouth to hand transfer. Um, that's an important milestone. So carrying objects to the mouth uh, is important. I mean, make sure they're generally clean. Make sure it's not the dog's toy. I mean, sometimes it is. Um, but in general, keep toys in their area that are uh, mouth safety, you know, and, and let them explore them. Language. At four months, we turn heads toward the sound of your voice. It is very cute. And the other thing, cooing happens like more in the three-ish month and there isn't really a three-month um, milestone, but around three months, babies will start to coo at you and then you can, um, they will coo back at you. It's a lot of fun. So if you say, hi, baby, wait a second, and they should hi back at you and it's wonderful. Um, okay, so motor skills. Remember how we said tummy time was super important? This is why. Holding head up in a supported sit is our four-month milestone. I'm holding you by your tummy, and you can now keep your head up nice and straight. Why is that important? Because we're going to put food in your face now. So you have to be able to protect your neck and airway so that when I'm shoving food into your face, it's going into your stomach and not into your lungs. So that tummy time served a purpose. Um, motor, holding toys. Remember when I said there are milestones that are in multiple domains. Look at holding toys and carrying object to mouth. Cognitive and motor holding hand in hand here. And then pushing up onto elbows while on our belly. So this is our like earliest step toward crawling. So at four months when we're on our bellies, I wanna see us starting to uh, upward facing dog off of the mat because that's gonna be the chest, shoulder and neck muscles that we need to then push all the way up and start crawling. Social emotional, smiling to get your attention before they smiled in reaction to seeing you. And now because they are cognitive thinkers, they're like, let's see how cute I can be. Do you wanna see how cute I can be? Watch me, big old smile to get you to smile. They also will start to chuckle. It's not a full laugh, but it's one of those like, ha, and you're like, my whole world is all better. <laughs> It's all better. Um, and the other part of this is that when they see you, this is the time that they'll start kicking really fast or making sounds at you to maintain your attention. So not only do they smile at you to get you, but then when they see that you're looking at them, they're like, watch this show. I'm going to kick. I'm going to be adorable. I'm going to spit up on myself. You're going to love the whole thing. And that's, I mean, it's really, they're trying to show off to you to maintain your attention because the longer they move, the longer you pay attention. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what do we do at home? And basically, Monica already went over No, <laughs> she already went over it. But it's it's mostly talk about if they're actually ready to sit in a high chair. They have no head lag. So when we're lifting them up in their arms, the head is not like falling back like that. They're actually carrying it up and they can sit and not be super wobbly. Uh, and they're interested in food. Some you know, some babies are not at all interested and they're not there yet at the four month mark. But so it's recommended to start introducing solids between four to six months. So it depends a little bit on, on where your baby's at and where you're at. Um, but we love introducing solids and it's very exciting. And, the, and that's a whole other topic of like how you introduce and so forth. But um, it should be around this um, age. We should do that. We can do that. We can do that. <laughs> um, and again, like she also said, to explore, let the baby explore. Like they love their hands, their feet. They put it everywhere. Uh, the toys, as long as it's not a choking hazard, then then that's, again, a normal thing. Because I have a lot of, you know, parents, they, they try to take it away and they try to like avoid putting anything in their mouth and they think it's weird. Is it is it that the baby's teething? Is it that it's hurting? They, they're they worried about pain rather than that this is actually a developmental milestone. So I think that's um, 
Oh, very important. That's your, you're so smart. Everyone's like, oh, I think my baby's teething. We're sticking everything in their mouth. Like they're just learning. Yeah. And most of the time that's yeah. the, the case. What's a six month. <laughs> baby pictures up here. Yeah. This is my niece. Um, I, I keep stopping at it. That's I know. Like, 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 no, everyone look at this at the cute baby. baby. <laughs> All right, so six months. So again, mouthing toys to explore them, reaching for preferred toys. So this is the age where it's so fun. They're like, oh, you know, baby Joey loves his fox or baby Amy loves her butterfly. Hudson loved a monster truck and a butterfly. I'm like, live your life, boy. Um, and then banging in play. So this is when people also start to say, oh my gosh, my kid is so violent. Like they'll take toys and like smash, smash, smash. Perfect. They're trying to figure out, we call it like object manipulation to explore environment. So like they're trying to think like, can I Throw this does it hurt does it move is it part of the floor can i make it part of the floor it's a great it's a great milestone language reciprocal sounds so that means if you go hey they'll go ah and then if you go up above bah, 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 they get so excited and they go ah bah. so it's them really trying to mimic back and forth like you can go back and forth a few times at six months squealing big time we used to call it shouting for attention but it's really like they're going to try to give you their very biggest sound because they're either super excited or you have gone out of their three foot bubble and they need you back. Um, and then blowing raspberries. It's, I mean, the best. It's the cutest. I love babies. Do too. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Motor holding the head up on tummy. So this is that all the way, all the way up. So like we are going, we are moving and grooving. We are at that 90 degree. Our our faces forward. We are ready to start crawling at six months. We might also start doing this weird rocking. I get a lot of calls. My kid is doing rocking. Are we autistic? I said, no, we are six months and that is okay. So that rocking that you're going to see is them trying to figure out, I want to get over there. I don't know how these limbs work yet. Maybe mm -hmm. I'll just shove my face in that direction. Um, moving both arms and legs, absolutely happening. And then social, emotional, knowing familiar people. So this is when we start to enter stranger danger. So this is, it's a fun milestone to see. It is a really hard milestone as a provider because these are the ones where your children will scream bloody murder at us during the exams. And I'm like, I, I promise this is not my first rodeo. Your kid hates me. It's normal. Um, and then looking at self in mirror, that's a really fun one um, because at first you could put a mirror in front of them and they're looking through it. They don't understand it. At six months when you put that mirror, they're like, oh, that is me. I know that's me and I'm so cute. Um, and then laughing. This is when the chuckle turns into full on belly laughs. And um, I mean, it's just it's the not, best. It's it, the best. It's wonderful. Um, so by six months, uh, in other words, if no other medical conditions or other reasons, most babies need actually to eat solids by six months. So we need it so that we're not we not anemic most babies that are just breastfed we encourage even more to get some iron supplements um but if a good iron rich diet then that's enough so little by little we're introducing more and more and that's really important important i think also at this time we really need to let the baby you know the babies explore um we always talk and point about things that we are seeing and reading and and we just want to sort of reinforce that we continue with this reading and talking and singing throughout not only at the newborn stage or not only at one stage like that's really important to to do and usually we would say like just talk when you when change the diapers you're doing whatever you're doing just say it out loud and and yeah, then sports casting yes. she called sports casting just narrate your own life <laughs> It's wonderful um but yeah so to try to avoid having them just propped up in a seat uh, we don't recommend walkers that's more for i i do feel like I, we see developmental delays from walkers but also it's more because of the risk of falling downstairs and so forth so it's more a hazard in in that safety regard uh but i also feel they tiptoe on their toes they don't put the pressure they're not doing um i see developmental delays with that so yes the same thing with the jumpers it's not mm -hmm. great for the hip development I'm, I'm not loving them i mean if you put any of those toys in front of a physical therapist they will set them on fire they're not they're just not good for your kid um and you know i was always kind of laughed at because they said that i let my child go feral because we didn't have any walkers i just like let him go mm -hmm. and i that's just the best that's just how it you is do it. it is i mean i think those little uh cages but being on the floor and as long as they have like some thick carpet or something that it's that it's softer for them so they're not bumping their heads but otherwise like having them on the floor is the best thing and they can explore and they can uh, see they don't have to be in um 
and walkers or anything. No. And of course, at any time of these, especially at the six months, they are rolling and they're moving. So no high elevated couches or beds or anything because they're going to fall off. I'd rather have you put your baby down on the floor if you need to do something because they roll over even if they have never done it before. That second that you move away and don't watch them, they're going to roll over. Yeah. Um, And I just put it in here because sometimes I feel like people don't know. But in general, uh, this is me. It doesn't have to be around the time that they get the first tooth, but definitely six months and up. But if they don't get it until after their first birthday, that's fine, too. But in general, they should start brush. You should start brushing the teeth after the first tooth eruption. And we do recommend uh, fluoride toothpaste. So a rice grain amount twice a day. Very important. <laughs> okay so nine months this is also the time so if you're coming to me you come to me for this um eval um if you're not coming to me you're coming to dr godoy and she will be doing a formal screening at that time again different than the eval i do a full evaluation she does a screening we hold hands during this whole journey together um this is the, uh the newer one so at nine months cognitive huh. visa, yep yes so um you guys, I will update this slide for you. So the nine-month cognitive that we should be doing is going to be casting toys. So throwing some toys um, and then another nine. Yeah, see, this is not updated. Um, another nine-month um, cognitive that we can do is, I'm going to have to pull these out of my head for real now. Um, are the, oh, yeah. Is it here? That's fine. Yeah. Guys, the um, slides can update, but I will update for and I'll send them out to you. So um, a nine month cognitive that we do is pulling puzzle pieces out of puzzles, not yeah. putting into puzzles. So and take it out. Up, yes. Uh, so if you have pigs. Yes. If you have a cup <laughs> with blocks, I want one block in and out. Two or three blocks is going to be 12 to 13 months. Then for the um, pegs on a pegboard, if we can lift one or two out, that's a nine month Um completing and putting in is not until 14 months. So I always joke that this cognitive um, thing is going to be um, like the on milestones. We take things out of cups, we take pegs out of pegboards, we take puzzle pieces out of puzzles. We're not yet proficient at putting in and matching. We just realize that those two things are separate. Um, language, these are going to be our first gesture. So we're going to be lifting our arms to be picked up. Um, you'll notice that. And we're also going to start some reduplicated babbling. Now, this is different than actually saying mama or dada. This is um, just duplicating a vowel and a consonant over and over and over again. So, um, 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 are we actually saying mom? No. Can we pretend? Absolutely, yes. Ada, 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 ada. Are we actually saying dad? No. Will he say that he's absolutely saying dad? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just let I let you have it. Um, mom and dad are with purpose is closer to 13 months. Um, but if your kid's saying it, I'm going to check, double check, and we're all going to be happy. Um, and then at around nine, closer to 10, so don't go crazy. Um, if you call their name, they will look over at you and it's wonderful. And this is when we realize when you guys call your babies by their nicknames and not their actual names, because I don't know how many times I've been in an office and I'll be like, Lawrence, 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 nothing. Hey, booba though. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> okay. So we all know that no one's being called Lawrence at home, um, which is my absolute favorite because I don't think I've ever called my name, my son, his actual name ever. He's always bubs or boobs um, or boots. I have a problem. <laughs> so our nine month uh, motor is sitting independently beautifully and obviously starting to crawl. Crawling is one of those things that used to be like seven months. We really cared. It's pushed closer to nine months. Um, and this is where all that mouth exploration comes into play, which was a cognitive milestone, but now it impacts our motor milestone. This is a hand-to-hand -hand transfer. So a toy going from left hand to right hand is about eight to nine months. And then raking food towards yourself. So again, why we want your child to start exploring with food at six months is because by nine months, I want them to be able to reach pincer and bring to them. So they can't do that if they've never practiced it. Again, that's where Puffs or Cheerios on a little high chair for snack time and playtime. It's not just for food. It really is for learning too. Social emotional. So again, recognizing strangers was at six months, nine months. The stranger danger is real. So when mom and dad start to leave the room, that is when the meltdowns happen. And the cause of this is because they're realizing that mom and dad are no longer part of you or Gaga and Papa or favorite sister, or favorite Aunt Mo is not connected to you. So when you leave, they're like, oh my gosh, they're gone. 
The problem is, is that they don't realize um, that you can come back. So object permanence is not yet a thing. So you're gone and you're gone forever in their mind. That's why they have those huge reactions. It's not because they're anxious or sad or it's because they really do think you're you're gone and then you no longer exist. So that's so playing the games where you put toys and you pick them back out again, super helpful. Like show that like things come back <laughs> like mom and dad we come back um showing emotion this is where they start to make those adorable grump faces that show up in all those memes or those really surprised oops faces nine months is when that happens um again a nice thing to do is play peekaboo i'm gone but not forever that's this is when we're starting to enjoy those types of games because the thought of leaving and coming back is just something that's forming in their mind Let's see if we can um so in other words to continue doing it the nine months <laughs> um to repeat sounds to in point like we always already said before but uh and make babies work so on the floor leave them on the floor they can try to reach things and that's how they're gonna you're gonna get them going not serving them everything um, and they wave bye-bye, they play the peekaboo, they, um, do all of it. Let the baby feed themselves, let them make a mess, try to make, you know, it in a way that you're not getting it all over your carpet or anything, but like, try to have a sp space and time for him. I usually give the baby a spoon and then you, uh, have one spoon so that you're also sure that you're getting some food into the mouth because a lot of times it's all over and you feel like, what did he actually eat? Um, but so if you're doing that, but also letting them explore, they need the textures, they need to try different things, they need to feel it, and and uh, they will eat regularly with a spoon later when they are, are older. And we like straw cups. We like straw cups because they can form, I know the feeding therapists love it, they can form them out, you know, um, so it's a good thing and it's a good, uh, so usually we recommend those more than regular sippy cups. Um, so if you're feeling like they're ready to, to drink from a cup or, you know, and when they're eating to have water or whatever you want, then I think that's what we, yes. Yeah. Those transitional cups, as much as they're a wonderful marketing ploy, they're the same exact motor plan as a bottle. So they're not helpful in any way to me. Um, so a straw cup is a smaller, O. Oh, it's a different motor plan. That's what we want to get toward. Um, and our, then we have 12 months, our last milestone for this talk. Yay. So blocks in and out. So remember when I was saying that nine months was our unmilestone, we were just taking things out and not knowing how to put things in. This is where we're like, oh, this, we can do both. Um, and then peg in and out of holes, sometimes multiple pegs, but that's closer to 14 months. Um, finding hidden toys. So this is very cute. So remember when we were playing peekaboo, this is now when they figured out that when things leave, they still exist. So then that they can uncover things that are under blankets. They'll start to search for hidden toys. It's so fun. Um, again, taking puzzle pieces out, but not placing in yet. Placing in is around 14 to 15 months. Um, but but I'm saying this because I want you to put the puzzles out for your children at nine months because I want them to practice these things so that they understand them, so that they learn the out and then eventually the in. Language, waving bye-bye. Remember, we just practiced that with Dr. Godoy and, and now we can do it. We're actually calling you mama and dada now and meaning it. It's wonderful. Um, and then they understand no. Whether or not they are listening to you is a different thing. If you say no and they stop and look at you, and pause for a second, acknowledge that you've said no, and then continue to jam, you know, <laughs> crackers into the dog's mouth, they understand no. Whether or not they're listening to you, I can't help you with that. Um, motor, motor is um, we're really starting to pull to stand and cruising on furniture. So this is what we're expecting at 12 months. Before we said that was closer to about 10 months, but now that's what we're wanting. Walking well, walking multiple steps, five steps alone is closer to 14 months. We have kiddos that walk as early as nine months. This is why we have these checklists and milestones, because if you're comparing, if your only knowledge of this is your cousin's kid down the street and that child walked at nine months and you have a child that's not walking at 12, you're going to be worried. I am not worried. There, this is a huge window of when people can walk and it's really dependent on things that you cannot com, com, like control. The head size versus body size, how many rolls are on your kid's thighs, whether or not you carried them the entire time. All of these things impact how your child reaches these milestones. And that's why we say don't compare to other children. Drinking from a cup. We ask you that you start your straw cups so that by 12 months that we can actually drink from a cup. 
pincer grasp. We ask at six months that you put those Cheerios out in front of your child because at 12 months, I really want to see either a three-jawed chuck or a two-jaw pincher. That's what we want. Um, social emotional participates in patty cake. I mean, is there anything better? No. Stranger danger is back. Has it ever left? Why does your kid never go to Uncle Joe? I don't know. But the reason that stranger danger is now back is because they realize that everyone can leave and come back, but they actually can't move to get away from somebody that they don't know. So all of these are perfectly logical reasons why your kid is absolutely terrified of Aunt Nancy. But like there's that's why, because we can't run away from her. And I wish I could, too. Um, separation stress. So this is, you're going to see this a lot. Oh, my kid used to transition to nursery school so well. And now I'm so guilty because when I drop them off, they cry and cry and cry. It's absolutely normal. It's so, so heartbreaking and sad. It, we will get over this in about three months. I promise it goes away. Yes. Um, so at the Tom month, this is our last month. So like I said, we uh, just want to reinforce again, basically it's not recommended to have any screen times for your children uh, in the first two years of life. Uh, we definitely promote singing and music and, and, and so forth, but we sort of see it as the brain is put on pause. Some parents come and they say, Oh, he sings a full song. And it's, and it's, uh, you know, because he watches this, I don't know, wheels on the bus all day long, but it's sometimes they just like repeating the sounds and it's not that they're actually understanding it. And it's sort of um, just this repetitive thing. So a lot of times we, we really want to promote and point and talk about, you know, pictures and, and, and so forth. So I think that's one of the things, um, <laughs> like we said, yes, they probably understand no, and they should understand no. They, uh, we say, try to use the no instead of saying that all day long uh, for really dangerous things, and then try to direct, try to give them two other options, and or like, oh, look at this flower here, or like, look at the bird, and and you try to say other things to redirect them instead of saying like, no, don't touch that, oh, don't do that, oh, you know, always being that no sayer. Mm -hmm. Um. And you need to baby proof your house. Now they're starting to reach other levels. They're starting, you know, if you haven't lowered your crib before, which you should probably should do around six months, uh, but then it, it needs to be lower and you need to baby proof um, your home. And after the first year is when they recommend to see your first dental list. Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so. so what happens when you miss a milestone? And that's what happens when you go to Dr. Godoy and she's like, hey, some of these things aren't happening and they should be. What should you do? Do not panic because we have you covered. Um, there are lots of different, is it a next slide? I'm not sure. Let me see. Oh, these are red flags the actually, red flags. if you want to talk about the. Yeah, let's go to red flags and then I'll do mine. Yeah, that's fine. No, you want to do it? Yeah. No, you do red flags, I don't care. Um, okay, basically, so we miss a milestone or we don't think either we have no response to sound. Are we worried about, uh, and this is at birth, we are doing the hearing screen. So that's a one first screen. But if we're not responding, we're not feeling that the baby, you know, is turning to sounds and so forth, then should we do an actually formal audiology evaluation to think that they should have some drive to communicate by four months. So they should be looking and, you know, making noises and sounds and that like back and forth a little bit, um, uh, and like she was talking about before. So that's uh, uh, important. By six months, usually they actually almost respond to, you know, they know their name, they, mm -hmm. they know what you're saying. So they should by at that time also like really respond to, to their name. So these are more like the communication ones. Um, and if they don't say no, any mama data by 12 months or no verbal routines, nothing by 12 months, then that's also a red flag, even if they had the earlier milestones, but we don't have that uh, at that time. Um, for motor, most of these are actually for nine months, so, uh, but in general, so we want them to be able to roll both sides, usually roll, rolling both sides. I feel like that's more of a four to six months, but I know they changed it a little bit, but so this is like the latest nine months is a late time to have this milestone. So that's already like, we need to do something for this, um, sits well without support around nine months again. It's like a six to seven. Exactly. Yeah. Like usually we see that as six to seven. So if it's not doing that by nine months, then again, uh, we don't, they shouldn't prefer a hand um, 
now so if we say oh my my son is already a lefty or my you know my daughter is that's actually a red flag and and that should not be n never before 12 months of age um and we should transfer from hand to hand again that's usually a six months uh thing where we try but nine months is when we we should have um hit that milestone and we shouldn't regress like she was saying Sometimes they stop talking when they're learning another milestone from another domain. Yes, that happens, but we're not losing words or we're not, they weren't speaking three, you know, <laughs> no, but they weren't. Right, you were stringing it, together three words and now all of a sudden we're back to one word. Yeah. That's three, regression. We don't want to regress, exactly. Right. If, we've, if we've lost, this happens. The way motor milestones work is that it's a smooth progression that's built off of um, each milestone. So like um, rolling begets. Uh, crawling position, crawling, but gets crawling. And then, it, so it all builds off of each other. Language is a hot mess roller coaster. We have six words, we have two words. We gained a word, we lost a word. We said pumpkin once, and then we didn't say it again for six months. And then you're driving yourself crazy because every week you're like, are we regressing or progressing? Language is insane. But if you have the general idea of like using words to make wants known, and you have that skill, that skill should not go away. If you have the skill of reciprocal communication, that skill should not go away. Um, so that's what we're talking about. So for um, for what should we do when we are missing things? I think I wanted to get to this um, uh, slide because I really wanted to talk about this. Oh, when we talk about missed milestones, why we want you to sit at six to nine months, but we don't act until nine months is because for most of our interventions, there's two types, there's two roads we can do. There's two places I can refer you to once I'm like, hey, we need to act on this stuff. One is early intervention and one is center-based care. Early intervention is a state-run program. It is available in every single state. It is different in every single state. So for early intervention in New York, it is free. For early intervention in New Jersey, it is income-based, and they will ask for your W-2s. Would I say it's affordable? In New Jersey, if your copay for um, center-based care is reasonable, $35 to $50 a session, chances are your copay for early intervention is going to be astronomical. I, I think that they do that on purpose. Um, but in New York, it is free. It, both of them are in your home. They're not center-based. So the, uh, the provider comes to your house. The evaluation is always free. The people will come to your house. They'll evaluate your child and they'll say, okay, you um, qualify. What does that mean to qualify? You need a 30% delay. So you can't just be a little delayed. You need to be significantly delayed. Or you need a delay in two different areas, meaning you can't have a child who's singing Yankee Doodle and finishing puzzles and just a little slow to crawl because that is just a delay in our motor domain. Um, and that makes sense because remember when we said sometimes you're just a progressing in a different area, the state is not going to come out and um, provide services for you for what might just be you having a language moment. So you need to have a delay in two areas or a very significant delay. Center-based care is insurance-based. Um, we have at uh, Valley, we have the Center for Child Development. We have physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech, feeding. I'm sorry I'm plugging, but we have everything and I love it. And I send my own kid there. They're great. Um, there are other uh, therapies in the area, depending on where you are and where you live. Um, but it's all usually insurance based. Um, so that means you go there, they run your insurance, make sure they take your insurance, they will um, build goals based on an evaluation, or they should if you're going to a place and they're not doing that, that is not a good place. Um, so you have to have goal based therapy, I want my child to stretch out their torticollis, I want my child to crawl, I want my child to put their own food in their mouth, I want my child to learn language or improve the way they're saying things. All of these are goals. Um, and typically when we have goals, it needs to be based on some sort of diagnosis. And then that gets people scared. What do you mean diagnosis? Usually I mean gross motor delay, meaning my body's big muscles aren't moving. That's the diagnosis. Expressive or receptive mixed language delay. My child isn't talking the way we're expecting to. Um, developmental delay, meaning my child is just generally making milestones way later than we expected. Um, so those are the things, these are the diagnoses that we're going to use to prove to insurance that your child deserves to be at our center. Um, and usually upon resolution of our goals, when we've met our goals, you no longer have that diagnosis, you've been cured of your gross motor delay, and then I discharge you. Um, the evaluation is usually covered by insurance, 
but I always say you should, should check because mine wasn't. And I paid a lot of money out of pocket to have someone else tell me exactly what I already knew about my own kid. Um, so it, it's important to know the difference. Some people, if we have a significant delay, will choose to do a mixture of both. So they'll get early intervention in their house once a week, and they'll also go to center-based therapy once a week. That's perfectly fine. We are not, I think there's always this like concern that we are somehow like Yankees versus Mets. And there's like this rivalry between early intervention and center-based care. But the reality is, is that we're pitcher and catcher on the same team. We're working toward the same goal. And many of our therapists also do do early intervention on the side. And I sometimes will refer you to early intervention because I think it's a better fit for your family. Let's say you have another young child at home or twins, or you can't get it to our center or you live 50 minutes away, sometimes early intervention is a better option or the only option for you. Um, so I never want you to feel that uh, that we are only offering things that are benefiting us. I, we don't care. We want you to get what's best for your kids. Everyone is on team baby. Um, also, um, sometimes we'll do a check-in and I'll say, you know what, I see something, but I'm, I'm going to wait about six months. We're going to do these stretches and let's see how those stretches go. Let's see how this one thing goes. Um, because sometimes early intervention won't qualify you, but I know that if we do these interventions, we can either move past this little hump or we're going to qualify the next one. The trick is with early intervention, if you go and you don't qualify, you cannot ask for another test for six months. And that's where it gets tricky. So if you didn't qualify, but there is this one thing we want to work on, I would suggest then going to center-based um, or coming to me and we can talk about where our next best step is. If you didn't qualify for early intervention, but you're still nervous about a milestone that was either missed or doesn't look great, we can talk about the next best step. Sometimes it's going to be um, a short service we provide, or sometimes it's like a full-blown thing we can do for you. I know we're almost uh, oh God, I'm so sorry I talk so much. <laughs> no uh but so basically um what we just wanted to say in general for the milestones uh, uh when the first year of the baby that me as a pediatrician we do screenings and we do surveillance during our web visits and they're like shorter versions while Monica as a developmental MP like she will do the full evaluation and it's like longer visits and it's all, and then um that, and that this is expected to do throughout childhood. So that's why we also think it's very important that you go to your well visits. Sometimes they're like, oh, we don't know what we're doing there. They're, if we're not due for any vaccines, we don't have to, you know, it's not important that we come or, or the opposite. But um, but we do have a plan for it and that's um, important to follow. And also if you ever have concerns, maybe we are not concerned. And we also, for example, I see you for maybe 20 minutes in a visit and I the baby might not be very comfortable with me in the office and they're not going to do, oh, they're not going to do everything. Like it's also sometimes about, you know, you have to voice if you have any concerns and we should take that seriously and you should be evaluated then. Uh, and like, like she said before, like learn the science and act early. The earlier we act, the, the better and the earlier we can get an intervention. And then the outcomes are so much better too. Um, and I think that's it. This is just our information and I know we have maybe some questions uh oh we cannot hear you I still can't hear you I cannot hear you either my mic was down can you hear me now <laughs> yes, uh, yes okay <laughs> sorry um so we actually do have two questions so the first question is at what age do you recommend moving the baby from bedside bassinet to the crib oh that's a great question so usually I there's a weight limit on some of those guys. So some of you are making some real chonker bubbas, and I those are my favorite bubbas. But usually by about three months, sometimes that rolling is not really great for the bassinet. So if your child is starting to do that roll, straight to the crib you go. Also, if your kid is starting to like hit that max for the halo doesn't have a very large weight limit at all. I was surprised. Um, so if our um if we're re reaching the weight max. So I, I don't really like kids over three months in those things. Yeah, no, we, they, I feel like they also, they start moving around so much. So you feel like they're bumping to the sides and if depends if, on the bassinets, but if they have that fabric to their face and they start half rolling in you're there, out. then yeah, then you cannot be there anymore. Um, All so, right. It's not a set like age or a set time. Yes. Um, uh, I think Abby was next. For the milestones, should we be seeing these by a certain time or is when we should start seeing them appear? So for example, at nine months, should we be concerned if we don't see or by nine months? That's a great question. Um, 
So like we were saying before, sitting is at six to seven months. If we don't see it by nine months, we are concerned. So I think that's the difference in the language. That's why the screeners that are at the pediatrician's office have different months than the milestone exact markers that I have in my evaluation. If you are so concerned that this is a matter of a month or two, like, right, if, if something is, is concerning you that this is keeping you up at night and not your baby, you, you just come in and we'll figure it out. We are in the business of ruling out. We'll never say no to you. I'm happy. And I've had plenty of beautiful, full-term, healthy children come to my office because the parents were absolutely terrified and they wanted a full evaluation. I'm happy to do that. It does not matter to me. Alrighty, and the last question is, is an activity center considered a jumper or a walker? So kind of, yes. I know that there's this thing, if you can adjust the activity center so their foot is not completely flat but not completely toed at like 30 degrees, I know that sounds really crazy, then I'm less insanely furious about it. I would like you to limit the amount of time. I think some people use those activity centers as babysitters. You can spend time in those, but you can, but it's not great for them to be on their hips like that if developmentally they're not supposed to be there yet. Alrighty, um, I'm not too sure um, for the last question, but we purchased a snoo which keeps baby on their back. Is that also at three months? I always, I always read about six months in the snoo. I'm not too sure if you guys are familiar with that product. I know the product. I know that it's like a straight jacket uh, for the baby. For the, for the baby, I don't know the actual. Um, so I don't. Or it, I know they. Have. So the recommendation, I think, is whatever they say. But I will tell you that this new, we don't. Not that we don't love whatever keeps your baby asleep. Wonderful. I don't love this new because it doesn't promote like. Um, it doesn't promote physiologic sleep positions, if that makes sense, because it is a baby straight jacket. So usually for my, my preterm kids, I'm like, as soon as we should be rolling, I want you out of it. Because what I want is your kid to roll over at night because those are normal physiologic movements. So if you're in your baby straight jacket, it's really hard for us to get there. It's the same thing with the baby Merlin. Um, the thing oh, like that's that. like a, the real straight jacket. I have so many kids in there that are now not bringing their arms forward because they're stuck in a straight jacket at night. So while it's getting the job done because your kid's sleeping through the night, it's getting the job done at the cost of normal physiologic positioning. Mm -hmm. So that's from a, you know, someone who's crazy. Um, uh, and last one. Question. When do you start treatment for a flathead? Mm. I love this question. Yes. So we do a lot of torticollis work for our preterm kids. Um, I would tell you that doing it helmet too early is not good for your baby for a lot of reasons. I want your baby to be able to hold their head up by themselves before we have that helmet on, because if your kid can't lift their head and then you've added six pounds of nonsense to it, we're not getting any milestones done. The problem is cranial technologies or whatever place you go to, that's the one that most people go to here, um, won't tell you that because they want to sell you that helmet. Um, so they'll put that baby in super duper early. I want, and this is a trick question because I'm not giving you the exact month, I want your baby to be able to hold their head up in an assisted sit before you put that helmet on. Usually that looks around four months. Before then, if you have plagiocephaly and torticollis before your helmet, we can be doing physical therapy to help you get off there. There's plenty of beautiful stretches we can give you. There are beautiful stretches I can, if you want to go offline, we'll do it. Um, but if you're concerned about your head shape, please come see us. It's something that we can treat with physical therapy before a helmet. I also have a really cool band that I measure your plagiocephaly and show you how severe it is and show you exactly, is it treatable, not treatable helmet time. So it's not a matter of opinion. There is, there are measurements. But there are also that... The helmets a lot of times they help you in the in you know in the acute setting but some doctors are not going to promote like the neurosurgeons they don't always uh, recommend them because naturally when you're not on your back the whole time when they can do better tummy time when they are actually sitting up more than not just laying on their back the whole day you know that's when it naturally is going to get better shape so sometimes it, it's really also the degree of plagiocephaly not just a little bit like it's it's um yeah, so this there's not a straight answer uh, or I'm, like this degree or at this age or right, at any of that. Right, and this is why we have um, professionals looking at this. A flathead doesn't mean you're definitely going for a helmet. Sometimes a flathead means that physical therapy is your option. Getting you to uh, your child to tolerate tummy time better is probably going to be more successful than helmets too because studies have shown that helmets aren't always super successful. Cedars jump with it. And... That's a really great question. So because we're in um, high chairs or those bumbos or those things, the cute things with the high chairs, that's for 
a certain amount of time for a seated meal. So I think that's the difference. People are like putting their kids in these extra saucers and like cleaning their whole house for two hours. Mm -hmm. Um, being in a high chair position, usually if you're in a high chair and it's not, um, and your baby's not quite sitting up all the way, I don't mind a rolled blanket. I don't mind that. But at that point, your baby is sitting, I don't know how to do this, sitting with your back, your butt and your legs, right? So that's a physiologic sit. That's normal. These standers, your baby's hips are like, this is your back and these are your legs. Your baby's in a standing position, which babies aren't supposed to be in yet. That's the difference, right? So when you're seated for a seated I mean, this is my whole life. <laughs> when you're seated for lunch, that 90 degree angle is a physiologic sit. Because think about when you sit your baby on the floor, your baby's back and leg will also be in a 90 degree physiologic sit. It's those extra saucers where your baby's in that standard position. What that's doing is tightening your hamstrings in the back of your baby's legs so that when they go to crawl, these are the kids that are going to be stuck in that um, army crawl for a long time because the back of their hips have gotten too tight and they're not being able to create that then 90 degree angle to start crawling. Wow. I'm really crazy about this. Don't ask me anything about it. It's great. Reasons. It's great. I don't know um, about it's great. Um, thank you both so much. That was a great presentation and um, very informative. Um, that was very helpful even for me who has a two-year-old. So we have two more questions. Um, they just said thank you. Okay. Um, at this time, I'd like to ask everyone to take a few minutes to just fill out the evaluation um, you will receive on the original confirmation email and give us our feedback um, as we take them um, for new ideas for future programs. Um, thank you both again so much. That was a great presentation. Um, and looking forward to seeing you guys very soon. All right. Thanks. I hope you guys have a great thank evening. You. Thank you again. That was great. Thanks. Do you want to do you want to um type the answer to um M Styers? Oh, there's more coming. There's one. Yes, what happens there. if you know your baby's head is always leaning to one side? Um I mean basically that could be torticollis that she it was could be talking about that you could been have the muscle here is like shortened and so you can do stretching exercises, but tummy times a lot of times ha helps. And sometimes most babies are going to prefer one side when they sleep. They're going to naturally go to this side. So I always also tell parents, like, move the, the bassinet or the crib in that room so that they face you, but a different side so that you're alternating the head when they're sleeping at night. Because sometimes it's just that the baby just always sleeps there. And if the parents don't in the beginning move that side, they're going to get a flat head there. And then it's going to be hard for them to move it to the other side. So it doesn't have to be because of torticollis. Is it just correct? happens to be but the stretching and tummy time is again very yeah. important and the physical therapist can help with that correct uh very much